was coming to me. So the father divided the property between them. It wasn't long before the younger son packed his bags and left for a distant country. There, undisciplined and dissipated, he wasted everything he had. After he had gone through all of his money, there was a bad famine all through that country, and he began to feel it. He signed on with a citizen who assigned him to his fields to slap the pigs. He was so hungry, he would have eaten the corn cobs in the pig slot, but no one would give him any. That brought him to his senses. He said, all those farm hands working for my father sit down with three meals a day, and here I am starving to death. I'm going back to my father. I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against God. I've sinned before you. I don't deserve to be called your son. Take me on as a hired hand. He got right up and went home to his father. When he was still a long way off, his father saw him. His heart pounding, he ran out and embraced him and kissed him. The son started his speech. Father, I've sinned against God. I've sinned before you. I don't deserve to be called your son ever again. But the father wasn't listening. He was calling to the servants. Quick, bring a clean set of clothes and dress him. Put the family ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And then get a prize-winning heifer and roast it. We're going to feast. We're going to have a wonderful time. My son is here, given up for dead and now alive. Given up for lost and now found. And they began to have a wonderful time. All this time, his older son was out in the field. And when the day's work was done, he came in. As he approached the house, he heard the music and dancing. Calling over one of the house boys, he asked, what is going on? He told them, your brother came home. Your father has ordered a feast, barbecue beef, because he has him home safe and sound. The older brother stomped off in an angry sulk and refused to join in. His father came out and tried to talk to him, but he wouldn't listen. The son said, look how many years I've stayed here serving you never giving you one moment of grief. But have you ever thrown a party for me and my friends? Then his, then his son of yours was thrown away your money on the horse and shows up and you go all out with a feast. The father said, son, you don't understand. You're with me all the time and everything that is mine is yours. But this is a wonderful time and we had to celebrate. The brother of yours was dead. He's alive. He was lost, and he's found. This is the word of the Lord. May he add a blessing to the meeting. I don't know how many of us have ever studied family system theory, right? It doesn't say who was the oldest or who was the youngest son in that story of the two sons, but, but in your mind, based upon simply rivalries that you might have, how many think it was the first one that ran off? How many think it was the second one that ran off? You know, I have the same problem in my household because I have two sons, and, and I relate to the story a lot because the dynamics between the two of them, right? My, my oldest is always the one who's trying to, to please everybody by being the oldest and, 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 and trying to earn, you know, all that stuff. And then, you know, the second one comes along, and, and you might have seen the commercials where, you know, you've got the mom who's the firstborn child, and she's got, like, you know, 30 bags on her to be able to go out, you know, to the store or whatever. When the second one comes along, you know, you're just grabbing whatever and going out the door, right? <laughs> it seems to be much more laid back for the state, more freedom and, and liberty to be able to do whatever they want. You know, that, you know, you're not as worried or concerned because you've kind of figured it out by the second one. Well, I've had this challenge, like I said, in my own household. My, my oldest son goes, you know, Levi, who's my younger one, Dad, you let him get away with whatever he wants to. He gets to do whatever he wants to. We keep on running into the theme over and over again. And it's just part of, you know, family system theory of understanding, you know, birth placements. Not to say that that's always the case or the way it always is, but, but there's always some sense of rivalry between siblings in terms of, that, of why have I worked so hard and I've done so much and yet so-and-so does this and you still love them. And you still give to them, and you still help them, and you still aid them. And you know, when is this going to come about? Well, I'll tell you, out of all the years of ministry and whatever training I did in seminary or in college, nothing prepared me to understand God better than the moment I became a father. And when I became a father, I remember I was sitting in the hospital up in Maine. And there was a little room at the end of the hallway. My son had an infection, so we had to stay there for 10 days. 
while he was receiving antibiotics. And we would go to this little room at the end of the hallway, which was the sun room. It had beautiful windows with sunlight. And I would sit there with this newborn baby, you know, in my lap, and I'd look out the window. And sure enough, what was on the other side of the parking lot from the hospital, but a prison. And I could see the walls and the barbed wire on top of it. And it just kind of hit me in that moment going, how many fathers or mothers held their child like this as a newborn baby, never knowing how they were going to turn out? And now their sons or daughters are in that prison. And it really was profound for me in that moment of going, will I ever stop loving my son as much as I love my son in this moment? And will the parents of those who have children that are in that prison ever stop loving them? remembering them in the moment in which they were born. I think, you know, in the story of the parable of these two sons here, you know, the reality is, is that when a person becomes a parent, you love your children. You, you have no guarantee in life of what direction they're going to go, what choices they're going to make, what, uh, what things they'll do along their pathway. They may be able to win a Nobel Prize, or they may end up in a jail. There's no guarantee of how much you can control as much as we all want to be in control of raising our children. We teach them, we love them, we nurture them, we never stop you know, making that sacrifice. So even when it is difficult and painful and hard, we never stop loving them. But it does look at the context of the story that Jesus tells in this parable of the two sons of why did the son who was faithful and remained by his father's side his entire life working in the fields and had to boil and didn't go and squander his money, why did he ever get the banquet, right? Why did he ever get to have a party for his friends? Why did he ever get the, the recognition that this brother who had run away from home? The reality is, is that you know, the father loved both sons equally, rather, rather regardless of if they had stayed home and worked by his side on a family farm and, and done the family business, or if they had gone off and done their own thing. Love isn't defined so much by what we do, right? It's defined about who we are to one another. Love cannot be earned, and that's the, the beauty of the message of what Jesus is trying to convey here. God's love cannot be earned. But love, God's love can be understood when we understand who we are in relationship to God. See, this one son knew that he was a son that deserved to be recognized because of the work that he had done staying on his father. He knew his place. He knew where he was. He knew that he had a father that loved him until this other son came home and the rivalry and the jealousy kicked in. But, but even before that son came home on the distant horizon and his father saw him, he still knew that he was loved by his father. He knew that he was still cared for by his father. He knew his place. He was happy. He was satisfied. Only in the moment when his brother returned did jealousy enter into the situation and there was a sense of, it's not fair. It's not fair, Dad. And that's part of that family system theory, right? Among siblings, we're always going, it's not fair. And the reality is, is you know, as children, we want to think of the world as being fair and equal. But as we grow up, we realize the world is not and the world is not equal. And we cannot compare who we are to others based upon the scale of fairness or equality. As much as we all want it, as much as we say something that we should strive for, the reality is, is it does not exist. There will always be opportunities that will make us jealous of others. When our neighbor comes home with a new car in the driveway, and we go, why can't I afford that? Or so-and-so gets promoted at work, or gets a salary raise, or gets to do early retirement, and we go, why can't I do that, right? Why wasn't I recognized? Why wasn't I praised? You know, I, I don't want to point out generations, but I think, you know, all of us know that, you know, younger generations nowadays, like, it's amazing as I look at the technology that we have of, of what they do, and I will admit, like, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit old school sometimes with my son's generations, and I look at it, I'm going, you only got a trophy if you came in first, and now everybody gets a trophy, right? 
<laughs> there is a sense of, you know, we don't want to leave anybody out or exclude anybody. We don't want rivalry and, and jealousy and those things. We want to recognize everybody. We've done, we've done amazing things to be able to, to build about this, but there's still mindsets of those who go like, I was first and you were fifth, but we got the same trophy. <laughs> yeah, you know, but but here's his father. He sees the son of the distance. Now the one that's there knew his place, knew his love, never questioned it, never said anything about this until the sun on the horizon appears coming back home. And there's a difference. The one who had stayed by his father's side knew his place, knew he was loved, knew he was protected, knew that he had the ability to, to, to be able to work on the family farm and didn't have to worry about you know, being hungry or lost or things of that sort. He was blessed, but he didn't recognize that he was blessed. This other son that had gone off and squandered the fortune, perhaps there was a thought of it's not fair, but love doesn't matter when it comes to fairness, right? And so the son comes back. This other son was lost, not physically lost, right? He had gone off on his own. He had free will to choose where he wanted to go and what he wanted to do. He knew where the family home was. He knew where his father was. He knew how to be able to go back. He wasn't lost in the sense that he could not find his way back, right? There's a difference of, of being lost. He was lost in the sense that he didn't know if he still had his father's love or not. That was the fear, the fear that kept him away. If I come back, will I be accepted? Or will I be rejected, knowing that I deserve probably to be treat, treated differently than the way that my brother is treated because I went off and I did this and this and this? Would I be welcomed back into the family if I come back again? He was lost in the sense that he didn't know where he was in relationship to his father and to his brother and other members of the family. Now, the father and the wisdom that he had, the only way he could convince the son to be able to know that he was found was to give him this party to be able to recognize him, that he still had value and worth despite the mistakes that he had made, that the title of son would never be taken away from him, no matter what the choices he made. In the essence, the father wanted to show him that the love that the father had for the son had not gone away based upon what he had done. Now, sure, the father probably was disappointed, right? There's no question of, of you know, you know, the sacrifice that the father made and, and, and the squandering of the inheritance that the son had and all those things, that there probably was some level of disappointment in the choices that were made. But the love was still equal to the day that the son had left home, and that love was still equal when the son returned home. You know, we live in a world that this idea of understanding of love, if we want to think of love in terms of equality, this is the story of love and equality, right? Because it's not based upon what we do or what we earn. Love is unconditional. Now in the Greek, the love is broken down into three categories. Perhaps you've heard it before. There's, there's philios, which is a brotherly love, a love between siblings. There's eros, which is this passionate love between couples. And then there's this idea of agape. Agape is a godly love, an unconditional love. You know, I look at the story of, of Good Friday and Easter, and what does that communicate about God's unconditional love? I went to a, an ordination uh, ecclesiastical council where a candidate was going through the process. They had to stand before all these ministers, representatives of churches with the ecclesiastical council. They had written a whole paper on their theology of ordination, and they wrote in the paper, I see no intrinsic value in Christ dying upon the cross. It was a brutal death of no purpose or means. I was taken back by this. Now, other than my colleagues wanted to push this candidate through. Uh, clearly, she had done the work. She had thought a lot about the process, but she saw no redeeming value in Christ's sacrifice upon the cross. So I turned to a buddy of mine and I said, I said I'm going to ask a question. He goes, you going to ask a question? No, I said, you need to ask the question. We can't pass this person along unless we ask the question. So I asked the question. I said, if Christ could come down from the cross, and it was within Christ's ability to come down from the cross. Why did Christ not come down from the cross? If you think it has no value or meaning. What was the purpose of Jesus staying up on the cross? If he had the ability to come down from the cross. The candidate didn't know what to do with that situation. 
but she worked on the fly and, and, and saw where we were headed with this and kind of changed and adapted you know, what was in the paper. And it was a suitable answer to be able to get to the end of it. But I'll share this with you as I look at the cross and what the cross means. What is the worst thing that humanity could do? What is our truly worst that we could do? Here is Jesus, the beloved Son of God, and we put him on a cross, and we executed him. And a father, in rage or anger, that I think would be a normal reaction for a father, did not end the world on Good Friday. The world did not cease to exist. Rather, three days later, Jesus comes and continues to spread the message of hope. See, God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's John 3.16. My favorite passage of Scripture comes after that, which is John 3.17. For God did not send his Son to the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in him is condemned. This is the verdict. The light has come into the world. But men love darkness. They will not come into the light for fear that their deeds are evil. But whoever loves God comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly through them that God loves them. My favorite passage of Scripture. We talk so much about God's love, but we don't realize God's love is not to condemn us. Jesus came not to condemn us. God does not condemn us, even when we do our worst. <coughs> which is to put the beloved Son of God on the cross. If God can love us like this, the story of Jesus and these two sons makes so much sense that even though the Son had gone off and done things that probably were terrible things, you know, things that we would never want our children to do, that love never goes away. Jesus was communicating to us what the Father's love is for us. If we think of God in the context of Father, we don't have to use Father, but Jesus used this image of basically explaining that the idea of a parent's love for a child, no matter what they do, never goes away. God loves us to the point that even in that moment upon the cross, when he put his son upon the cross to die, God did not stop loving us. God did not condemn us in that moment. Rather, God chose that moment to say, I would use this as a redemptive moment because they are lost, they do not know the limits of my love, and I will show them three days later how much I love them when my son rises from the grave and continues to spread the message that they are redeemed and loved, to welcome them into the family and to know that this is their place, that they will never be cast out from it. As a church, this is what we've come to understand and what we hope to be as being a church family, that we are a family that loves one another. We all make mistakes. We're all imperfect. We're all jealous at times. We look and say sometimes it's not fair or equal. It's just part of any you know, group of individuals who are part of this family system theory that we live in. But the reality is, is each and every person who is here, whether you've been coming every day of your life for 70, 80, or more years, whether it's your first time here, God loves each and every one of us equal, and we have equal claim to be part of this family, to share in the blessings that God has given us within the context of what it means to be the church, this body of Christ, which is a family. As that said, let me offer this prayer for us today. God, help us not to be jealous of our brothers or sisters, Help us not to compare ourselves to others. Help us to not think that we are more holy or worthy than those who have made mistakes. And allow us not to think of ourselves so low that we do not have a right to sit at the table. But welcome us into this home to know your presence and to feel your love in this place. That in your redeeming act upon the cross, you gave us the right to be called your sons and daughters in this place, enriching our soul and our spirits to know where we belong in this world and to know the value that you have given us. It is not a cheap value. It is the value that was paid for with the blood of your son, Jesus Christ, who died upon the cross for our sins. 
we give you thanks for the blessings and honors to be able to gather at the banquet table in this holy place. We praise in your name. Amen. <coughs>
Lord, continue to be with us as we gather as a church. We pray to live in a world where there is peace and justice. We pray for our leaders to be wise, not to be sworn towards allegiances, but to be directed for the good of the people. We pray for the peacemakers to be able to bring about a resolve to end conflicts around the world. Lord, we pray for the church to be strong, the vast network that we have to be able to care, teach, and provide in all the corners of the earth. It is only done through, through the passion of the knowledge from one generation to the next. May we continue to be able to pass on the legacy of love that you have given us, the church, that we may proclaim your message of hope, and those who hear it may receive it with joy in their hearts, and to know their place in the world, that they are beloved children by you, and that we treat each other as brothers and sisters, with you as our divine parent. We pray these things in your holy name, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen.